we looked at all of the things that people felt would be safe. We also looked at some of the hazards, which we'll get into, and uh, just asked them a series of questions of, you know, would you ride if this, that, the other thing? And the majority of respondents, the vast majority of respondents said they would love to ride their bicycle more if they felt it was safer. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is Dr. Matt Schaefer, general surgery resident at Wright State University Premier Health. We're gonna be talking about a study and survey that he did about perceptions with bike lanes. It's fascinating, so let's get right to it with Dr. Schaefer. Matthew Schaefer, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast, welcome. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Matthew, I love giving uh, my guests an opportunity to introduce themselves. So uh, I'll turn the floor over to you. Yeah. Uh, so long story short is uh, my name is Matt Schaefer. I am a fourth year general surgery resident. I will be applying to trauma critical care uh, surgery fellowship programs later this year. Uh, looking forward to taking care of critically injured patients. Um, and I have had a long history and a lot of experience with how the built environment impacts public health and impacts our patients. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Yeah, you and I know each other through our mutual good friend, uh, Dr. Dick Jackson, uh, who has been a guest here on the, on the podcast. And uh, so, so tell me more about that long relationship with health and the built environment. Yeah, so it, I guess it started out back at, when I went to undergrad at Grinnell College. I knew that I wanted to be pre-med and the, the ultimate career goal was medicine. I was a kid who grew up in the suburbs and didn't really think much about the built environment, really saw the uh, car as the key to freedom, and then went to a residential school in rural Iowa and had the opportunity to be a wellness coordinator, a hall wellness coordinator, um, and kind of learn more about how college life and just anything around us affects our well-being. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go on a, a trip to Denmark actually as a junior, investigating what make, what made them the happiest country in the world and really <laughs> had an interesting experience learning that they didn't think of happiness the same way we do. They just really see it as contentment and not wanting for anything. And then progressing along, I worked in downtown Chicago for a couple of years doing dermatology research. Uh, and that was the first time I really lived in a city without a car. And I actually found that to be extremely liberating and found that I didn't have to work out as much as I did in college to keep the same level of fitness and progress that to getting into medical school. I went to the University of Illinois at Peoria and uh, the urban infrastructure was nowhere near what it was in Chicago. Chicago, I, yeah. <laughs> I really wanted to be able to ride my bike or you know walk or run to school each day. But that was not a safe option. And then in applying for residency programs, I was really uh, pleasantly surprised. I interviewed at Wright State in Dayton and found that uh, there was uh, a bike lane all the way from my hotel to the hospital. And in the recruitment materials, they really advertised that Dayton has the most paved trails of any city in the U.S. And I was like, Dayton, Ohio has more paved bike trails. Like, how is this possible? So bring up the Miami Valley Bikeway. And yeah, over 350 miles of paved bike trails uh, going in and out of cities in the region. Uh, a lot of rail to trail network right. out in the countryside and all of that. And of course, as I learn more about health and wellness and medicine, one of the biggest things that we talk to all of our patients about is behavioral modification, lifestyle change, eat good foods, get 20, 30 minutes of exercise a day, and you know, try, try not to be sedentary. That's really the best advice we can give people on a baseline level. And it was just very interesting to me that we can tell people this all the time, but we don't build places that make that easy. People have to go out of their way to go to a gym or out of their way to get to a doctor's appointment or to get to surgery. You know, how many buses or transfers or whatever does it take just to get to places on time? 
And we really build a place that forces people into the car. Uh, and I think it's very detrimental to people's health as a surgeon. I can say that we see a lot of obesity related diseases and it makes surgeries a lot more challenging. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was, I was surprised when I saw this graphic as well. Uh, so the Miami Valley, uh, bikeways, uh, nation's largest paved trail network. And it, it sounds like, uh, most of these are off street networks of trails, like you said, uh, rail trail types of things and uh, other types of corridors. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Fantastic. And, and that can work for, uh, for a community and for an area. I mean, you can really leverage those types of facilities. I, I love to call them activity assets. Uh, you can really leverage them, uh, to, to help facilitate connectivity and and safe inviting environments for all ages and abilities if this is a huge if they're well connected to the community and the community has access and the neighborhoods have access in other words when they're not just seen as recreational facility only where someone drives to the trailhead and then you know rides on them and then comes back to their car and goes but, you know, so it's, they're, they're wonderful assets. I mean, they're probably one of the most comfortable assets to have, activity assets to have, uh, because of the, the physical separation. And that's going to become a common theme of uh, what we're going to be talking about. Uh, but I get the sense that all is not perfect in Dayton, uh, because we also have a heck of a lot of this. So, so tell me this isn't your bike lane that you were saying that you were able to ride. Um, this, uh, coincidentally was the bike lane, uh, from the <laughs> hotel to the hospital. Okay. Uh, interest, interestingly enough, when I moved to Dayton, my now wife and I found a nice little town home, very close to the, uh, downtown baseball stadium and close to where that hotel was. And lo and behold, this is the bike lane that I take to work every day. And I would say normally at residency hours are pretty crazy. So when I'm going very early in the morning, this is not typically a problem. But we definitely have rotations where we're coming in on off hours or we're working overnight. And so when we're on a night shift, uh, we're actually going into the hospital usually during the afternoon rush hour, 4.30, 5 o'clock. And I would say pretty much every single day when I'm on one of those rotations, this is what my commute looks like. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, that thin parking lane off to the side, often people, they have very large vehicles and are not all the way over across the line. So they're sitting out into the bike lane. I'm worried about getting doored as this image <laughs> demonstrates. Uh, so very frequently I ride in one of the vehicle through lanes. And then of course that gets me hawked at and I think probably doesn't score any points for bicyclists in the area. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation. Yeah, it's a terrible design and it's really an, an old design. It's an antiquated design. This is a design that, you know, really was sort of advocated for decades ago of, yeah, oh yeah, we'll just paint a bike lane here and oh yeah, it, that's fine. It could be in the door zone. We don't care, you know, blah, blah, blah. And back in the day when it was just mostly just mammals that were riding, middle-aged men in Lycra and and more confident riders uh, that may be doing some commuting, may, riding to work, et cetera. And most of them were also middle-aged men <laughs> or, or young, brave and, you know, and fearless men. But at the same time, you know, like I, I would imagine, you know, you wouldn't feel comfortable having an eight-year-old be in this environment because it's, it's not an all ages and abilities uh, facility. And, uh, and yeah, I'm looking at this and going, wow, five lanes, you know, two parking lanes and, and then three motor vehicle travel lanes, uh, all in one direction. This is a massive high speed kind of corridor, it, whether it is high speed or not in terms of the signage, it clearly encourages high speed just because it's a massive tarmac. Yeah, that's right. And, and fortunately we'll look at the crash data in a little bit. Fortunately, I think because downtown Dayton is becoming more pedestrianized, this thankfully is not one of the high crash areas, but it, exactly right. They have the line, uh, the uh, lights timed uh, so that people can get a green wave. And so if you're coming in at the tail end of it and you know that the lights are timed up the way they are, 
uh, you can easily go 40, 50 miles down this downtown street. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And what's this? Um, so this one gets uh, further explained by the next photo, but uh, so this is actually this is actually the parking garage where I park my bike as evidence in in the second photo. Um, and so they have the bicyclists come in through the vehicle exit lanes of the parking structure with gates down. Uh, you know, you could come in on the other side of the parking garage, go up a ramp and then down a ramp and get to the bicycle rack. Or you can just travel an extra hundred feet down the street and go in through the exit area, which is a blind turn. Um, obviously, there are cars coming out, uh, but that is the only bicycle rack for this seven story parking garage. So, so what you're telling me is that they haven't necessarily really thought this out. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't thought it out even even when it has been pointed out to them um, that people do bicycle uh, and would like better bicycle facilities, better parking access. And uh, frankly, I haven't received a response. Now, and when you say they, who's they? Uh, so it, I don't want to throw my employer under the bus, so to speak. Uh, but but hospital administration actually... yeah. I, I will say the the physician recruitment team has been very responsive and has reached out to several people. But when I have tried to directly contact the Office of Safety, uh, I have gotten literally no response. And 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 it's not to pick on your employer, but I, I will make this generalized statement. You know, from the thirty some odd years that I've been in this uh, in this realm doing this work, is that one of the most challenging environments that we have are hospitals and medical districts and things of that nature. And, and the irony is just, it, it like is so thick because you're like, wait a minute, the, you know, these should be like health promoting places and these should be places of, of like you use the, the term wellness. But in reality, it's, you know, there, there's this car brain mentality of, you know, oh, well, nobody would ever ride a bike here. No one would ever walk here. No one would use transit to get here. It's like, ah, no, seriously, guys. So anyways, so we're back to, to uh, some of the, the, the infrastructure here. And uh, so this is actually kind of cool. This is, this is a parking protected bike lane. It's not functioning the way it should, because there's a little confusion here, uh, with this particular driver parking in the bike lane, uh, nestled up next to where the, the, the parking meters are. Uh, but it's easy, you know, for us to take one look at this and see, oh, well, yeah, I mean, of course the confusion, you know, the, and, and a little bit of design tweak of making it impossible for a car to, you know, get across in, in, and park there, you know, just have a few barriers, like a few planters or whatever in that gore area there. And then voila, you've, you, you have a successful, uh, you know, parking protected, uh, and planter protected, uh, environment. But yeah, if the design's not perfect, if the, if the design's not quite right, we end up with this. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so this, uh, this is actually a view of Jefferson Street, which was under construction when I moved here to Dayton. And it is one block over from that first photo we looked at. So this is traveling the opposite direction. And uh, so this is the couplet. So this is the one way couplet. Yeah, that's right. And so this is kind of like you said, the newer design uh, parking protected with a buffer, uh, bike, uh, protected bike lane and to Daytonians credit, they have definitely gotten better over the couple of years since it's been implemented, but it's still not perfect. There's still no true protection, uh, in terms of physical barrier, preventing cars from getting over. So I think culturally people are getting a little bit more used to it, but very frequently I still run into the situation where there is a car parked in the bike lane or cars are double parked. And like you said, with a couple of small design tweaks, um, this was you know, after a little while living in Dayton, kind of starting to get frustrated with, yeah, we tout all the paved bike trails, but we still don't think bicycling is commuting. 
it's just a recreational activity. So getting a little bit frustrated, I vented on social media like a responsible adult would do. Uh, and so this is an Instagram post that I made uh, highlighting that the infrastructure was imperfect. And interestingly, some people not at all involved in bicycling or urban design or any of that uh, commented, you know, I think this would work better if they had just moved the parking meters into the buffer zone. I was just uh, going like, to say, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that could be part of the protection. Like, for instance, you, you know, I mentioned, you know, planters in that area. Uh, you know, increasingly, I would love to see, you know, a lot more depaving happening, a lot, a lot more, you know, jackhammers being taken to some of these things and and putting in some uh, rain garden stuff. But, yeah, in addition to you could have used those bollards, you know, <laughs> They could see your serve as bollards, those those parking meters. Yeah, move those parking meters over. Uh, and, you know, and that would help with that confusion. Uh, many cities are, are completely getting rid of the meters completely. I mean, they're they're actually using, you know, a, an app. And so the app you know, on the phone doesn't even need to articulate and, and communicate with an actual parking meter. And so there's none of that detritus, you know, on the, the, the sidewalk at all, uh, in, in those types of situations, then yeah, you can, you know, make the, the buffer area there very pretty. It could be a rain garden, et cetera. And you got your parking over there and, uh, and voila, we have a much safer and much more sustainable environment all in one. That's exactly right. Good stuff. So, you started doing some some uh, research and you started asking questions. And, and so this is you know a question of, you know, which one looks safer? And we're going to dive into to some of the research that you did. Uh, walk us through this particular image here. Yeah. So uh, shortly after um, uh, posting that first one to Instagram, I got pretty good response on it and more than I was anticipating. And then I went on a vacation down to Florida. We were in Miami and I was seeing some of the, noticing some of the different infrastructure and the different pedestrian and bicycle facilities there. And uh, just for me being a nerd and reading way more into anything that I have any right to, got really interested on what is the actual data behind, be, behind the different types of bicycle facilities which ones are better at present, preventing crashes or injury crashes, uh, fatalities, et cetera. And then I decided to just have a little fun with it, uh, make a little quiz. Uh, and over the course of vacation, would post a question each day and then follow it up kind of the next day with the answer and then post another question later that day. Uh, and I'm not a huge social media person just due to lack of time. And that's probably some of my most engagement <laughs> I've received. Uh, so people clearly are interested in it. Uh, I had some other posts that uh, I didn't share in this presentation, but you know, one involving the height of the front end of a car and uh, which, which one would be more dangerous. Because again, uh, being a general surgery resident, we work on the trauma service and we are the first responders in the hospital when someone has some type of trauma. So we are the ones who are doing that resuscitation. And if someone needs to go to the operating room for emergency surgery, that's on us. That's our, our purview. So I'm seeing people come in battered and bruised and broken in all kinds of ways. And really, I think it's something that's not talked about enough outside of our circles. And it's I, I find it really interesting and when you say motor vehicle size, this is kind of what you're referencing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, the auto industry, to their credit, bills bigger vehicles as safer. And I don't think we ever talk about uh, risk homeostasis and how when people feel safer, they actually engage in riskier behavior. And the negative externalities of larger cars and the increased crash rates and fatality rates involving larger cars or trucks, et cetera, uh, really flies under the radar, especially in the medical community. And I think is something that uh, there is some awareness of, uh, but probably not enough attention paid to. I, I anecdotally, and this is something that I'm working on uh, and will be a future study, but 
anecdotally, I feel like we get a lot more injured patients and critically ill patients from crashes involving SUVs and trucks than anything else. Uh, and then, well, it, and that makes sense. I mean, it's it's physics, right? I mean, it, we're talking about size and mass and speed and and all of these things. And you're absolutely right. We're, we're, we, the imperial we, society, we're not talking about it that much. Uh, the the more focused we of active towns and strong towns uh, and 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 others that are doing work in this arena, we're talking about it till we're blue in our face faces that this is a huge issue and we need to deal with this. So you somehow got inspired by all this and you're like, okay, let's start doing some some studies and so so set this up. Yeah, so uh, I have to thank Dr. Seaman. Um, he is one of our trauma attendings and he's pretty vocal about calling uh, crashes crashes instead of accidents. Uh, and one day he was scrubbing into a case in a different OR from me. And I, I was scrubbing. So scrubbing is just washing our hands, getting prepared to enter the operating room for surgery. And he said, hey, you know, I've seen some of your social media posts. Why don't you do some research on it? And I was like, okay. I had kind of thought I had to be a little bit more um, standard basic science or surgical outcomes research. Uh, and he brought up to me that, especially in the trauma world, injury prevention is a very big deal and is something that they actually publish uh, pretty frequently. And he said, you know, there, there are plenty of great outlets for you. And I think based on some of the things that you have already talked about, there are plenty of opportunities for research and uh, opportunities to write some papers in high impact journals. So let's, let's chat and see what we can do. Uh, we are not a huge academic research center. So we kicked around a bunch of ideas. I was lucky enough to just cold email people. Um, that's how I got Joe Wynell involved. He is one of the chief engineers on this for the city of Dayton, and he does bike to work regularly. And so he is one of the big implementers uh, behind some of the newer bike infrastructure with the parking protected bike lanes and the barrier protected cycle tracks that are starting to go into the city of Dayton. And I got in touch with uh, Matt Lindsay with the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, who is one of the kind of more data savvy guys who does some of the crash data uh, for Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission. And we put a team together and trying to figure out what, what are the gaps that we have? Uh, what are the issues that we face? And they said, they're always looking for more data. And one of the most difficult things to capture is near misses. And then we also don't necessarily know the, the city is taking an approach to try to follow Vision Zero and complete streets and implement bicycle infrastructure, but they don't have a lot of rapid feedback mechanisms or like a concrete feedback mechanism in place. So we figured that, you know, as a starter, we could, we could open up a community survey to get some of that data that they were missing and that could steer us toward some of the problem areas for future crash research and injury and fatality research. And so in digging into that, you know, found a lot of data that ever, I'm sure most of the people on uh, this channel would be aware of is that more and more people are trying to commute by bike. Let me let me pause you just there for a second. Um, when you say commute by bike, uh, I just want to make sure we're using uh, we're, we're on the same page in terms of, of terminology and and language. Uh, oftentimes, when the studies are done, they're and they use the word commute. They literally only mean the commute to work. I'm assuming that you mean something more broadly than just commute to work. You're, you're, I'm assuming that this is people are increasingly using the bike for everyday purposes. Yes. Yeah. I, I, in, in the research I read, it was more focused on commuting to work specifically. Well, that's ma mainly because of the, the the data source that they use. They use the American whatever it is, uh, you know, and, and that's a very problematic data set. 
to be mm-hmm. using anyways, because it, it's like the majority of the trips that people make on a daily basis actually end up not being the commute. And now mm-hmm. that work has shifted so much because of, mm-hmm. of being able to work from home, we're, we're starting to see even more. So I, eventually, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get better sources of data that really kind of like understand that, yes, Americans are increasingly using a bicycle and hopefully even walking and hopefully even using transit, you know, more frequently to go to meaningful destinations that aren't necessarily the office or the school. So that's right. And that is one of the things that we looked at. Um, and, and so, you know, in, lo- in looking into the trauma data, uh, even though the majority of crashes are vehicle to vehicle, the pedestrian versus vehicle and, you know, bicycle versus vehicle are disproportionately severe, disproportionately fatal. Anecdotally, those are our broken people that come in. Those are the ones that really raise your antenna for like, this is someone who's going to need all hands on deck. Yeah. Well, it's not a fair fight. <laughs> a squa- our our squishy exactly right. humans are, you know, it, it's, it, it's like, yeah. Okay. So, uh, on, under methods here, you're, you're talking a little bit about, um, what we've got going on. Walk us through this process here. Yeah. And so once we had settled on doing a community survey, our goal obviously was still to, to publish it somewhere. So I had to find a way to make it novel because there have been tons of these done throughout the U S which is a good thing. And one thing that I was finding is that there were a couple of studies where they had suggested preference for types of bicycle facilities, and even one or two, I think, that might have had diagrams for designs, but there, I didn't find any, and I hope someone can show me I'm wrong, I didn't find any with real-world photos of what different types of bicycle infrastructure looked like and how people responded to it. So I wanted to ask the community members of Dayton, you know, what do you feel when you see these photos? So we put together a web-based survey uh, so that we could display the images on it and uh, able to print it out as a PDF to make available at some of the bike share locations and things like that, uh, just to try to capture as many people as we could. And then, you know, with all research, there's our demographics table. Uh, I do I do like to point out that it was uh, predominantly male, but actually had pretty decent female respondents. Uh, I always try to, people who aren't as familiar with this area of research, try to emphasize that women and children are the indicator species of safe facilities. So the, fa- the fact that Dayton actually had a third close to a third of the respondents on this survey uh, be female is actually fairly encouraging. Of course, then you look down a little bit and you're like, hmm, everyone's white. That's not, that's not very good. Um, And I'm assuming that's not necessarily representative of the population demographics. It definitely is not. Okay. Okay. That's one of the challenges that that we certainly Mm -hmm. have. And you had 139 completed surveys. And then we start to talk about the difference between near misses and crashes. And so we've got your crashes at 26, near misses at 724. So yeah, far outnumber the near misses. And, you know, I I like to say too, that um, when we look at creating safer streets and safer roads, what we end up also seeing, especially when we bring our motor vehicle speeds down, is that there, you know, you just, you're not seeing as many crashes and as many collisions, period. And some of them may be considered, oh yeah, that was kind of a near miss, but oh, by the way, we were like, we were both going 15 miles per hour. And it was like, okay, it was like, it's certainly not a near miss that <laughs> sends your, your, your blood pressure up. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So this is no big surprise. So uh, walk us through this. We've got our different types of bicycle facilities down below, and I'm going to race ahead and, and, and give the, uh, the, the, the indications and I'll let you just kind of walk us through uh, all these different segments here. Yeah. And so what we found was that by and large, people prefer more physical separation uh, from vehicles, namely, and we'll get into what people felt threatened by on the road, but yeah, particularly on streets type of facilities. Um, but these were 
looking at all types of bicycle facilities and which ones did they feel the most safe or perceive to be the safest. And it's no surprise that the ones that are the most separated or are completely not on the street are the ones that are highest rated. Uh, and so we were looking at respondents saying safe or very safe and anything that had a substantial physical barrier. So this being either a trail or a separated path or a barrier protected lane, those were all the ones where over 80% of respondents said safe or very safe. And, you know, those are the things that the types of facilities that they would prefer to ride on. Yeah. 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 No, no, no big surprise there, huh? (laughs) So again, these are, these are the, the preference that, that people have. So again, we're, we're not really surprised by any of this, but now we're looking at perceived um, danger here. Mm-hmm. And so similarly, I uh, just from my own writing experience, thought about the things that, you know, again, put my antennas up, show me that things are going to be a little bit hairy and no surprise, cars in pretty much every format, parked cars, double parked cars, traveling cars, at any time a car is involved with a bicyclist, the bicycle rider felt that that was dangerous. The only, I guess, side one from that is that people also perceived scooters, motorized scooters that were unoccupied, left in a bike lane to be as danger. Uh, so we're, okay. yeah. Yeah, because so it's, 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 it's like, a, a, it's a detritus. It's like something, you know, it's a barrier that happens to be in there. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in, in this one, we were looking at everyone um, who replied as high or very high danger and uh, all of the things where over 50% of respondents said high or very high danger were involving a car or an unoccupied motor scooter. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. No, no real big surprises here either. No, no huge surprises, but this is the first time it's been done in our urban setting. Um, So it was useful for, again, giving our engineering department and our planning department more data just to say, you know, these aren't big surprises compared to other studies that have been done, but this is further evidence that it holds true for our locality as well. And there's some reason to keep doing what we're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So more people would ride if. And that's right. So we compared or didn't really compare, but we looked at all the things that people felt would be safe. And we also looked at some of the hazards, which we'll get into and uh, just ask them a series of questions of, you know, would you ride if this, that, the other thing? And the majority of respondents, the vast majority of respondents said they would love to ride their bicycle more if they felt it was safer. If the perception of the route or facility is that it was safer, they would ride their bicycle more. Um, and then additionally, they would ride their bicycle more if there were a comprehensive network of safe routes and trails. So again, it's not a huge surprise to us if it's easy, convenient, and safe, more people will choose it. That's kind of the flip side of induced demand that we can use to our advantage for building, you know, active transportation networks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love this part here too. So, you know, I, I've done my fair share of surveys as well. And uh, some of the cool stuff that comes out with the, the comments. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. As soon as I saw the uh, Wayne Avenue comment, I was like, well, I have to use that for, for all of the publicity. I uh, joke is on that respondent. I have ridden my bike on Wayne Avenue. I agree with them. Uh, 10 out of 10 would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. Are both of these uh, Wayne Avenue? Both of these so, shots? Yeah. So both of these shots are different segments of Wayne Avenue. Wayne so Avenue. Yeah. Uh, the one on the left is a little bit uh, further south. Um, actually, that's right by the uh, local grocery store. One of the only grocery stores downtown. And you see your stereotypical uh, two, two through lanes each way, uh, no middle turn lane, you know, uh, poster child for needs a road diet. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the most dangerous designs, roadway designs uh, ever 
developed by man. Yeah. Yep. And then photo photo on the right is a little bit closer to the heart of downtown. It's actually just outside of um, the historic, like very pedestrianized area, the Oregon district. And there you see one of the outdated bicycle lanes, you know, in between parked cars and a three lane. Yeah. Yeah. Door zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we are. So yeah. Boom. Yeah. No so, big surprises. Yeah. Again, yeah, no big surprises for, for the audience here, but a good example that Dayton is like many other American cities and that the people's perceptions here are similar to where they are in other places. And it uh, coincided pretty well with the city developing their first active transportation plan. Uh, so we were actually able to roll this data into some of the data that uh, Susan Vincent with the uh, Planning Commission was using as part of the active transportation plan. And I was able to present this alongside her at the Miami Valley Bicycling Summit uh, earlier this year. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. And of course, uh, you know, recommendations for uh, a safe systems approach to all of this and trying to really uh, do what we can to get to the root cause of these challenges that we have. And again, the root cause is that we have a dangerous environment. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And that, you know, as much as we study this and try to educate people about it, having good design really goes a long way towards influencing behavior. Kind of like we talked about earlier with bigger cars and people taking riskier uh, behavior, driving things when they feel safer. If the road dictates our behavior a little bit to behave safer or to walk more or bike more, then I think we can utilize it. Yeah. You know, I, I have to give credit to your, 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 uh, your machine here. So it looks like this is your, uh, get around town vehicle. <laughs> so, uh, this is actually brand new and I have not used it for a commute yet. I have taken it for a couple of spins. I literally put it together last week. Um, this, this was, this was a, a birthday present, uh, from my wife and have, really, have you taken her for a ride yet? I keep asking her to, and she, she says she wants a seatbelt, which I can't argue with. Uh, so I, so I think that that'll be part of the Christmas present. Hold on to my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, my, I, my yeah. waist is grippable. I promise. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I really wanted it in here just to highlight that I, I, because I work at a hospital and have to have pretty quick response times if I'm on call at home, uh, I do have a car and I do have to drive more than I would like to. And I recently took my car in for servicing and just routine maintenance on my car that I only put a couple thousand miles on a year was you know, four hundred dollars, and there, there, it's starting to get a little older. So there are a couple of things wrong with it that I was wanted a quote on to see, you know, how expensive would it be to get these to perfect working condition, and you know, to 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 fix a couple of mirrors and the latch for the console and the passenger side window to make it roll automatically uh, would cost f over fifteen hundred dollars, and this e bike was less than that. So I can get a whole form of transportation for less than maintenance on a vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I think is a really important thing to, to, to emphasize too, especially when we're looking at trying to create mobility systems that are, uh, are really equitable for, for everyone across, you know, an entire, uh, the economic spectrum. And we're looking at people who are trying to survive and trying to, uh, you know, participate in our community, in our economy. And if the barrier to entry is having to own and operate and maintain a motor vehicle, a car, it's, that's a huge barrier to entry. You know, and that and and significant. We know that significant amount of household incomes end up going to supporting these beasts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, everyone everyone gets shocked when I point out that uh, when you look at uh, percentage of debt in the United States, everyone knows mortgages are number one. That makes up fifty percent. Everyone talks about student loans at number two at nine percent, and I don't think I ever hear the media talking about auto loans being 
very close behind at 8%. So we're driving things that are making us poor, they're making us sick, they're making us unhappy. And we keep, for whatever reason, doubling down on it. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a good point too, to, to point out that when we look at the affordability and we talk about housing and, and the need for, for having uh, affordable places to live and affordable housing, oftentimes we forget that it's the combination. It's it's housing plus transportation. And so if you're able to, you know, leverage having an inherent network of safe and inviting facilities that you can then jump off of that is a great jumping off point to then say, okay, and how do we make our streets safer? And how do we, you know, connect more and more destinations that can be serviced by both the off street network, like we have represented here on the trail network, as well as, you know, some of the, the on street facilities, maybe it's leaning towards some of the quieter residential streets where we have lower traffic volumes and lower traffic speeds. And because it's going to be really, really hard to try to fix, you know, you know, these, you know, these are massive strodes and these are, you know, just not very attractive or comfortable environments, even with protected facilities. You know, when motor vehicles are screaming down through here, I mean, it's a noisy, polluting you know, dangerous environment, even with protection. And so whatever we can do to lean into creating a network, an entire comprehensive network of all ages and abilities, facilities, uh, the better and the more empowering it, that will be for, you know, everyone trying to, you know, participate in our, you know, in our communities and in our society and especially the extremely young and the extremely old. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, I don't think you should have to be at least 16 years old or under the age of roughly 80 to be a contributing member of our society. And, you know, more and more as people are living longer and living with more medical comorbidities as we learn how to treat them better, those are more and more things that might prevent people from driving or being able to drive well. And there are more and more reasons that they should be living a more active lifestyle. Yeah. I love it. Good stuff, doc. <laughs> Is there anything that we haven't discussed that you want to leave the audience with? I don't know if there's anything in particular. I think just if anyone is curious, you know, what, what life on the other side of the trauma bay looks like. Again, I mentioned that I want to go into trauma and critical care and um, the critically injured patient is, is something that I care very deeply about. I like, I really like having the opportunity to work with people who are in the worst situation possible and to see them recover and walk out of the hospital uh, and do better is, is extremely rewarding. Uh, but seeing what happens in those initial moments, you know, that golden hour of trauma that we talk about all the time and just seeing some of the carnage that we deal with um, is is pretty crazy and uh, it's, it's really eye-opening and it's something that I'm working on getting again some of our uh, city engineers and planners uh, trying to get them a little bit more aware of uh, if they could even shadow us at some point to see hey this is what the consequence of dangerous design looks like and right these are some of the challenges that we have, even for people that are not trauma patients. Some of the challenges we deal with in surgery with people who live sedentary lifestyles and are not getting enough activity. This is how this is making their kind of whole hospital course more challenging. I, I think that is something that would be very rewarding and something I'm happy to talk about with anyone who's curious. Yeah, yeah. And it's really the, the, the difference between this concept of, oh, accidents, accidents will happen versus crashes and collisions, which we know are inherently, 
you know, preventable. And, uh, I, in, in my younger years, I was, you know, very much in the trauma world myself. I was, uh, a, a ski patrolman up in, in the Lake Tahoe region. And so I was, you know, part of the team that would be responding to traumas, whether it was, you know, a, a skier on skier collision or, uh, a skier, you know, hits a tree sort of situation and, and dealing with that. But then also as part of the patrol, one of the things that we would look at is we would have a crash debrief and we would say, Okay, is there was there something about this situation that we could change the quote unquote design of the environment to help prevent that? And this is oh yeah, I mean we might want to change you know some of the the roping and the uh, around this you know this person just hit the one of the ski towers you know uh, for the lift or whatever you know maybe we should be you know kind of shifting this around a little bit or uh, yeah we've we've got a, a a merging area here where the higher speeds are happening and so start to, to change the design a little bit of how those merges are happening and also doing what we can for traffic calming to slow people down. So I, I really can, you know, relate to where you're at because the last thing in the world that we want is for somebody, you know, from a patrol perspective was, was somebody to have a traumatic injury and somebody to have a devastating injury and not only ruin their day, but potentially even ruin a, their life. And so we would do whatever we could to, you know, try to to help prevent what was preventable. And I, I get the sense that that's exactly the spirit that you're coming from is, you know, you're going to be there and have to deal with the things that do inevitably happen, but mm-hmm. whatever you can do to prevent them from ever happening, all the better. That's, that's exactly right. One of the uh, core principles of surgery is actually a morbidity and mortality conference that we do weekly. Where we talk about surgeries. We talk about things that went wrong, things that, even if it didn't necessarily go wrong, could have gone better. And how do we optimize every single case that we have and, and learn from any of the missteps? And uh, it's something that I don't think is regularly done, to my knowledge, in the transportation world. I have yet to sit down with, with a traffic engineer uh, after, after a collision and say, you know, what about this road design could have been improved to right. prevent it? To <laughs> yeah. prevent it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we again, can do our M&M conference and talk until we're blue in the face to figure out how could we have done every part of the resuscitation and the surgery and the post-operative care right to, you know, salvage every limb and every organ and give them the best shot possible. But really the best thing would be to not get hit or got, not get into a crash in the first place. Right. And right. so, you know. You know, we say in medicine, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So working on that ounce of prevention is really where I am most passionate. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the same thing that I've uh, told Dick many times. Thank you. Thank you for being, you know, engaged in the built environment and and thinking and being passionate about this particular issue, because we do need that voice. And it, it's clear that the city has appreciated the data that you've been able to provide to help and it's it's already being integrated into the future plans and hopefully we'll be able to see that uh, manifest itself in better design uh, in the future with those uh, you know future bikeways and hopefully truly an all ages and abilities facility for the future i certainly hope so and i'm here to help i'll keep banging the drum fantastic Dr. Matthew Schaefer, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Until next time. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Schaefer. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to the Active Towns website, activetowns.org. There's a support button there. Just click on that. And there's a couple different options. Uh, And by the way, if you decide to become a patron uh, via my Patreon page, you do gain access to all of this video content early and ad-free. So there is that added benefit. Uh, Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. 
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.